So today I'm going to be talking about government in the second half of the Tudor period. So Edward, Mary and Elizabeth. It's going to be quite a long video, just warning you. Well, let's start with Edward. So Edward had two main people in his government, in his reign. First of all, Somerset and then Northumberland. So first of all, uh, Somerset, well, his government structure and functionalism, he, he was quite successful in that because um, he governed with members of his own council, as well as appointing supporters of his own policies to the Privy Council. Seymour was also charged with, uh, with treason and imprisoned, so he could, um, he, he could control people quite well at the beginning. Failure, however, is that he created factional rivalry. Thomas Seymour plotted against Somerset with the Earl of, of, of Southampton, and his foreign policy was a failure in Scotland. He was arrogant and had a dictatorial manner, which created quite a lot of enemies. His style of government was seen as, like, it weakened him in the eyes of many of his opponents, as well as um, eventually surrendering after a long conspiracy made by the Earl of Warwick and Southampton. So he, he quit, I think that's the word. He also planned a coup later on under Northumberland, but got caught and got executed. And overall, he has a lack of um, effective leadership. In terms of finance, it was generally a failure. Um, he had very poor handling, which created confusion, uh, confusion and uncertainty. By 1547, annual revenue of the crown was only £200,000. Taxa the taxation he, taxation he imposed caused a lot of discontent, um, and this taxation was to pay for the Scottish War, which kind of ended up being a disaster. And he also put a tax on sheep, which was intended to deter um, enclosure, but it really created huge financial pressure on small farmers in upland areas. Then in terms of social factors, he was kind of, it was kind of a success, a bit, because the Western Rebellion was put down with an army of foreign uh, mercenaries, but it was all a kind of a failure because the Western Rebellion in 1549, well, it was against religion and the sheep tax I mentioned earlier. He also mishandled the rebellions, and in 1549 alone, there were 17 small rebellions. Then the big one being kept rebellion in East Anglia in 1549, well, this went against abuses against local, local landowners. And then in terms of economic factors, which is different from finance. Finance uh, deals more with the crown, economic it deals more with social aspect. Well, it was kind of a success because the rate of enclosure appeared to be going down. And well, there were a, there were a fairly good run of harvest, which got the price of grain stable and up until 1549, which was like when the rebellions happened and then when he, I think when he fell from power. And in terms, of, uh, in terms of economic factors, it was also kind of a failure because enclosure eventually became an issue. There were enclosure committees uh, which were appointed, but not much was achieved. The expectations of the poor were raised, and these weren't met, so they, the, the poor got annoyed. And the landowners were also annoyed. So overall, I wouldn't say um, Somerset was a, a quite... Somerset wasn't quite successful. Um, he was more of a moderate Protestant than Northumberland ended up being. So, let's talk about Northumberland. In terms of government structure and functionalism, it was kind of a success because there were two coups by him and Warwick. So, that was good. Um, he became Lord Chamberlain and he even stopped the coup by Southampton. By, not Southampton, by Somerset. It was a bit of a failure because he became less conciliar in his approach of government, but still, kind of a success overall. Then in terms of finance, it was a bit of a success because he brought in £1,033,333 as a French payment for the return of Boulogne, which had been captured under Henry VIII. Also, all chantries were taken down and the gold was given, was given and taken by the king. He was, by the way, way more radical than, than Somerset. He managed to reduce crown, crown debt from £260,000 to just 
and he even uh, made an attempt to stop the, the, the debasement of 1552. However, there was one failure, being the debasement of 1552. Then, in terms of social factors, it was an, a, a huge success because there were no uh, major rebellions. Maybe a few protests, but no, no rebellions per se. So, what is the succession crisis? Well, well left by Henry VIII stated that should Edward die childless, then Mary should ascend to the throne, and then if Mary herself failed to produce an heir, then Elizabeth. And this was not a big deal because, I mean, he was just nine when he came to the throne, he had plenty of time to, to like, get a wife and produce an heir. However, in January 1553, Edward fell ill. And by March of that year, he was clearly dying. And it became a huge problem because he was just 15, he wasn't married, and he didn't have any heirs, any children at all. Now, if they knew that if Edward died and they just said things like that, uh, Mary would take over and she would implement a really aggressive Catholic religious policy. Also, Northumberland had a lot of sympathy for Protestants, and his adoption of a more Protestant policy would put him under firing line, like in the firing line. So, if Mary came to the throne, she would definitely. Um, go against Northumberland, possibly losing his title and even his life. So he had to do whatever it took to stop Mary from taking the throne. Now Edward himself had an, this overwhelming urge to stop Mary from undoing his hard work in turning England Protestant. And this eventually resulted in the device. I'm going to talk about the device in a second. This would ruin Northumberland's reputation not only for his lifetime but for centuries after that. And this resulted in a civil uprising. So, the device. This was a change to Edward's will. Um, it previously stated that um, like the Edward's will that if he should die childless, which he did, the, um, the throne should go to Lady Jane Grey's male heirs. But by March, when he was clearly about to die, Lady Jane Grey, she had no heirs, not even male. So he altered it to say, and her male's heir. So instead of saying to Lady Jane Grey's male heirs, it would be to Lady Jane Grey and her male's heir. Heirs male, sorry. So it would mean that the throne would go to Lady Jane Grey and then her sons. Northumberland really pushed it forward for his own reasons, essentially. Um, he would be in favor with Jane Grey, so he would be in power. Also, Jane Grey, she was still a minor, so she, um, she would need a lord protector, Northumberland. Um, he would also be able to further his own standing because he was he could take, develop his own policies as well. And he even was her father-in-law, so he would benefit enormously as well as not only because he was a, she was she would be a minor, like I said, but also because his own family could benefit as well. Um, but this can also be attributed to Edward rather than Northumberland. Maybe it was Edward who wanted this to be passed. Because for his own independent reasons, because I mean, I think there was a, a discussion to marry Lady Jane Grey and Edward. And also because Edward was a keen Protestant, he didn't want to lose all the progress he had made. But there was no real plan for implementing the device, there was no army ready, and no strategy to do this at all, so it was kind of chaotic. Even when Edward died, um, Mary had been tipped off uh, about her family's intentions. So, she was, she was more prepared, and when, I, mean, I think I'm going to talk about this in a second, but when Edward died, Mary came to England, well not came to England, but came to take the throne, and she did, and was crowned Queen of England on the 19th of July. So, that is Edward. That is Edward's government. There's really not that much to go on. Then we have Mary. So, Mary. Um, during the whole succession crisis, there was genuine support for her claim. She did interpret this as England wanting to return, uh, to return to Catholicism, and that there was a lot of people in England who decided the Catholic beliefs to come back. But it was rather more loyalty, like to the Tudor monarchy, because Henry VII, Henry VIII, now Edward. So now, um, well. And they have another dynasty come back, come to the throne. They didn't want that, so just have Mary. And like people didn't really want to see a royal li uh, line die out when they shouldn't have. 
um, because of the whole one of the roses thing. That could cause chaos, so. Also, by this time, a return to the old religion was expected across the country. People began, the second Edward died, or the second it was announced, people began returning their churches and services back to Catholicism. And in London, it was fully Catholic by August. The return did not really cause trouble. Um, there may be some like, things in Canton Essex, but not, not a huge deal. And I mean, Mary herself, she had not been brought up to rule. So it was kind of a problem, but she eventually figured it out. Well, she was not politically astute and ended up appointing around 50 councillors during her reign, which caused a lot of factional rivalry. And also her, when the whole Spanish marriage, I'll talk about that just now, this was never formally discussed in the Privy Council. So this shows how she relied really heavily on the minority inner circle of, of councillors other than in the council as an institution. This included Gardiner, Winchester, Paget, And she also trusted uh, heavily upon foreign advisors. This included not only the Spanish ambassador Renard, but also Philip himself. So, the whole Spanish marriage. Well, if Mary would die without an heir, Elizabeth would become queen. Which meant that, and Mary knew this, that the whole um, Catholic restoration that she had done would be reversed, and England would turn Protestant. So, she knew that uh, what she needed to do was produce an heir. But by the time she came to the throne, she was already 37. She had, she had been the oldest of all the Tudor children. She was quite ancient in Tudor times, and well, in order to produce an heir, she couldn't just get anyone off the street. She was really Catholic, so she had to get married. So the priority was getting an heir, but in order to do that, she needed to get married. So that became her number one priority. There were a few uh, contenders, Owen was notably in England, Edward Courtenay, uh, but he lacked any real court skills. And if she were to marry an English noble, this would intensify rivalry so much. Um, also, England was famously xenophobic, and so she knew they wouldn't welcome a foreign, a foreign king. They had a fear that the foreign marriage would mean that England would be dragged into Spanish wars. I mean, especially if it was a Spanish monarch, as well as like Spain always like, conducting wars. Um, and Philip, there was a fear that he would control um, he would control Mary and eventually England because of a difference in status. So in order to, to solve this and to calm and rest, they draw up a, a treaty that gave Philip the title in, um, of king but none of, of like not the power. So you know how Oliver Cromwell and then Wolsey are like a king in all but name? When well Philip is a king in name but nothing else. So, yeah, that's kind of curious. Um, also, if Mary died before Philip, this would mean that he had no claim to the English throne. And Mary did die before Philip, and Philip can claim the throne. The throne, the, not the throne, the throne. And the throne would go on to the next in line, being Elizabeth. Also, um, it made it illegal for foreign men to hold uh, whole offices. So they can really gain like a uh, monopoly in government. That was kind of good. That, the treaty, this treaty was quite clever. And so it was designed to calm public fears, but failed to prevent Wyatt's rebellion. The marriage didn't actually take place until July 1554. And they met in person on the 23rd of July, but ended up getting married on the 25th. And this was kind of a failure on a political level because Mary never produced an heir. She had false pregnancies, but never an actual thing. And England was drawn into the Habsburg Valois conflict and ended up losing Calais. Then in 1555, things did not get better for Mary because uh, there was a new fiercely anti Spanish Pope, and as you know, because of the religion part, um, Mary did have problems with the Pope. And she had really hostile relationships with it. So, why is rebellion? Now, you remember Lady Jane Grey? Uh, she had been imprisoned and she, uh, her life had been spared. 
Now she was involved in the Bites Rebellion too, in order to overthrow Mary. But this time she wasn't as lucky and ended up uh, getting executed. Mary did promise her safety and hopefully um, take innocence in the plotting, but obviously Lady Yangbei, no. Lady Yangbei technically is a nine-day queen, that's her official nickname. And technically, 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 she could be considered to be the first queen of England, although she was never crowned, so the first official queen of England would be Mary, um, Mary the First. Also, um, the Wise Rebellion showed how um, minority opinions of the Protestants could not be ignored. And it, it just shows how many people disliked the whole idea of a Spanish marriage. And, well, Mary became so paranoid that she even arrested Elizabeth and sent, him, sent her to the Tower. As we all know, Elizabeth did not get executed because she ended up ruling. Um, Mary became obsessed with the idea that Elizabeth knew of the rebellion, even though Elizabeth denied this, and she had really played no part. There was no interrogation uh, that could find Elizabeth guilty of actually being involved in this. And, um, well, uh, Wyatt, he had almost taken London, and if he had, then Mary would have likely faced a premature end to her reign. So, that would put Elizabeth to the throne, and that's kind of why um, she was so paranoid. So Mary took this brave and wrestled stance, and really was quite lucky because she suffered no losses in no losses in counselors, which is, which essentially means that nobody defected to the to the rebel cause. So now the structure of government. In terms of personnel, we have um, most notably Gardiner. Who, um, he was a father's secretary and a holder of religious conservatism during Edward. Um, Mary eventually lost confidence in him because he didn't support um, Catherine of Aragon. And, well, he was secretary for Henry, but not. But, like, not nowhere near as wealthy, you know, or Cromwell. But he had made such he, he had made himself indispensable so Mary can just not deal with him. And he did help in passing really Catholic policies. And in terms of churchmen, these were including from those were during Edward's reign, excluded from influence, so she could really rely on people from the church in government because they just weren't there. Then we have conservative councillors, um, like Lord Padrich, then we have Cardinal Pole who became distanced from circular, secular issues, and foreigners involved in government, most notably Philip of Spain, and Simon Renard, the Spanish ambassador. Then in terms of Privy Council, kind of a success because, uh, well, the supervision of routine administration was reasonably effective, considering everything. Um, there was a general administrative continuity going from Edward to Mary, so there wasn't a big chaos transition. Um, the number of working councillors was quite small and cohesive, so it was, yeah, it was a small group of people who, well, it was easier to agree with, technically. Um, there was a Kenningall faction, which remained devoted to Mary throughout Edward, so she had supporters um, in her government right from the beginning, even though, even before her like the beginning of her reign. She, was, she had scopal administration committees uh, to which uh, working councillors were attached, and she also could trust these councillors. That was quite good. And even Philip himself, when he came to the throne, he set up an inner council of nine members, which combined working administrations um, and strength of the inner council and the concept of conciliar committees. But it was also kind of a failure, the whole Privy Council, because it was too large. I, when I say, I mean, number of working councillors, it was small and cohesive, that was good, but it was still too large, if that made sense. There was a lot of factionalism here, and um, it was factional, faction driven. And there was no real attempt to discuss the whole Spanish marriage. This can be seen as like them respecting royal prerogative, but. Hmm. Um, Kennicom uh, faction, uh, the role in the council, especially under Elizabeth was was limited and well the inner council didn't function too effective like too well it wasn't that effective 
then in terms of parliament, uh, was kind of a success because they had more cooperation rather than any real conflict between crown and parliament. There was no systematic opposition to the crown. And well, in terms of social and economic aspects, there was relatively quite a lot of cooperation. Um, there was a willingness to seek compromise whenever it was possible, so there was no real open conflict between Parliament and Mary. And, well, the Crown once, like, they didn't really press on Philip's coronation and the whole exclusion of Elizabeth after Parliament's rejection. But Mary respected Parliament and Parliament in turn respected her. So it was still kind of a failure though, it wasn't entirely a success because, well, there was still opposition to the Crown's religious policies. Um, it was, they also ensured death of Crown's original intentions, or on two occasions. And the Crown was forced to guarantee the continuation of lay ownership uh, of former church lands. Then in 1555, there was a bill to sequester the property of Protestant exiles, but this was defeated. Like, this was bad for Mary, obviously. Um, and she also, and Parliament also refused to comply with the Crown's demand for, for taxation. In 1554, uh, Parliament also rejected this bill to include uh, Philip in order to protect the clauses of the treason laws. So, Philip in the treason laws, there was no mention of Philip. These were only protecting Mary. Then in 1555, it prevented Philip's official coronation. And in 1554, like going back, it also rejected the Crown's proposal to exclude Elizabeth from succession. So, like Mary tried to exclude her, but Parliament said no. And she didn't press on it. Mary knew she couldn't really um, like go too hard on Parliament, so she let Parliament like she let them be there. She didn't press on the issue and cause further conflict. Then, in terms of poverty, well, 1556, 1559 were dreadful years for the country. There was a huge, huge influenza epidemic uh, with huge numbers of like the mortality rate was off the charts. There was a series of harvest failures, the most severe of which in 1556, and um, taxation was really high due to the whole Habsburg Valois conflict, because um, well, Mary was dragged into this. So, um, um, and the war, whole wars with France really didn't help uh, yeah, with taxation. There was also a law against grain hoarders, uh, which was enforced. Um, also, there were local initiatives um, against grain hoarders. JPs were also appointed as overseers of the poor, and there were laws encouraging the, conver the conversion of pasture, pasture land to tillage. Then, also in terms of recoinage, which by the way is like, 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 the, like in, well, increasing the value of the coin, well, implementation was really put off because of extreme difficulties um, these difficulties being war, disease, harvest failures. Then, in terms of revenue administration, it was a bit of a success because, well, the new, new of Northumberland, uh, he set up a commission to investigate the formal administration of crown finances. He also implemented these changes in 1554. And, well, eventually Lord Treasurer Winchester, he took over. Then the whole exchequer with Court of First Roots and Tents and the Court of Augmentations was there, so that was kind of good, as well as an introduction of more efficient augmentation methods into the exchequer. Also, uh, crown lands were increased, like the, um, the revenue from them was increased. Then in 1558, the whole Book of Rates was published, which kind of plays a role in Elizabeth's reign. Um, there were also additional duties placed on import of non-essential goods, and increased customs revenues, uh, like the customs revenues were increased quite substantially. But it was a great success, like successful, the whole revenue administration was amazing for what it was. But the problem is kind of a failure because Mary didn't see the benefits these took too long to implement. And that's why the whole Elizabethan Golden Age happened because the economy was good because of those these Mary reforms. Then, in terms of naval and military reforms, well, they undertook a complete um, reorganization of the administration and finances of the navy. Six new ships and others, uh, six new ships were built and others were repaired, and it was an annual sum of fourteen thousand uh, pounds to the navy in peacetime. Now, these six new ships and repair and whatever like, money to navy, this was given to Mary by Philip. 
And this would come back to bite him when in 1588 the whole Spanish Romana deal happened. So that was not that was not a win. Um, then also Lord, it was kind of a success as well because Lord Treasurer Winchester administered naval finances quite effectively. Um, the whole national system of mushers with penalties for absence from masters and corrupt administration modernized uh, and the whole system for provision of weapons was modernized. So that was quite good. But however, it was kind of out of date because they, like, they needed to perform the methods by which troops were raised and these were not to, to date, obviously. So a bit of a failure. Then we have in terms of boroughs, well, they tried to enclose, not enclose, sorry, um, ensure stability by assuring strong local governments in towns. And they also issued charters of incorporation, which did um, confirm existing rights or even confer new rights to on towns and even enabled them to, to act as corporate and permanent bodies of law. So not too bad. So that is Mary. As you can see, that is Mary. It's not, not that much. The big one is Elizabeth. Now, before I go on to Elizabeth, you probably have heard the term the Mid-Tudor Crisis. Now, the Mid-Tudor Crisis, what is this? Um, the reigns of Edward and uh, Edward VI and Mary I. Now, the reigns of these two little Tudors fell into, into insignificance when compared to the reigns of the two big Tudors, that being Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. Um, Henry VII isn't really counted in this. Um, well, Henry and Elizabeth had really long and really dramatic reigns, with the whole setting up the government and religious policy that we see today in England, and then Elizabeth's 39 Articles, which is literally the foundation of the church structure today. But, ever, um, but however, but um, Edward and Mary experienced much that well, you can't ignore it, it was significant. With the whole re restoration of the reputation of the new, new governor of Dunmerland, and Mary's reign, uh, which contained a lot of, uh, almost worth your credit, but Mary didn't reap the benefits, it was Elizabeth. So that is kind of attributed to Elizabeth, but in reality it was Mary. Well, also, um, a religious turmoil that had been happening in these 11 years, so Edward and Mary, could, was still present when Elizabeth came to the throne. The, rebe the rebellions uh, focused mainly on religion in the north, and social dislocation was as evident in the 1590s as it was in 1549. So this was still Edward. So there was not really a mid tutor crisis. So we should just like stop using that term and move on. I'm saying like mid tutor period. That's it. And now we move on to Elizabeth. And this is the big one. This is like a huge jump. So let's start. Well, Elizabeth came to the throne on the 17th of November, 1558, that's also the date when Mary died. And well, the succession was relatively easy. Before her, before Mary's death, she had acknowledged how Elizabeth, well, she should be made the next in line because Mary clearly didn't have an heir, she wasn't getting anywhere, so why not put Elizabeth? And this, I mean, eventually benefited Elizabeth because she came to the throne quite quickly. And so, um, treaty with Philip that had been made when I mentioned that Philip would not inherit the throne if Mary died before him, made that Philip had already agreed to not take the throne, so he, she didn't have to fight Philip. However, by the point she came to the throne, uh, England, well, so society wasn't that great because England had been um, plagued with really bad harvests, and then the flu epidemic had raised mortality rates um, massively. The whole political and religious situations were quite delicate, so she had to be careful. And well, Elizabeth was like, I don't know what I so much of religion. At the beginning, she was really moderate, but I know that I don't want Catholicism, so I need to take all this and make it Protestant leaning. She also had a view of government that quite resembled her father's, not in her personal touch, but also in that she needed to be fierce and strong-willed. She could not uh, be pushed around. This is helped because she was a woman, so she needed to prove herself even more. Uh, she also had been taught the art of rhetoric, uh, which was usually kept for men, so that was kind of a big deal for Elizabeth. And also regarded all elements of government as part of a royal prerogative, and Elizabeth was, uh, not only had a really strong sense of royal prerogative. 
She insisted on taking the most important decisions by herself and accepted absolutely no opposition to them. So, what is the role of some key personalities? Well, most importantly, and you can't talk about Elizabeth's government without him, is William Cecil. He is the most important and served Elizabeth for almost the entirety of her reign. Right from 1558 to his death in 1593. So he died five years before Elizabeth did. And he, he served her all the way through. Then we have Robert Dudley, which was the Earl of, he was the Earl of Leicester. He was an important military figure and promoter of the Puritan cause. And, um, well, in the whole crisis of 1562, he was kind of appointed the successor if Elizabeth were to die, and that caused a bit of drama and instability. And also, he was kind of Elizabeth's lover. And then you have the whole relationship with Elizabeth and her ministers. Um, well, Elizabeth, she was just as determined to rule as she wanted to, to reign. This does not mean the same thing to rule and to reign, it's not the same thing. So she wanted to have a personal approach. Well, within a month of, of Mary's death, Cecil was rising in power, and he was joined in the council by close colleagues such as Bacon and Russell. Now, Elizabeth, uh, while she should retain her first council, some of those had served Mary, more for a source of continuity, but like, you can see, like some people who knew how the country was being governed. But she did um, remove some of Mary's favorites and her close counselors, most notably Paget. Now, consider government under Elizabeth. Well, government of Elizabeth's reign was criticized for allowing factional rivalry, especially between Dudley, Lester, and Cecil, um, also Lord Burgley, I think it is, but I'm just gonna call him Cecil. And like these focus on really specific things, including the Queen's marriage, and at the like almost at the end, I'm gonna talk about the whole factionalism. Uh, also, the early structure of Elizabeth's government did prevent uh, factions from gaining power, so no single minister could control patronage. But as the reign went on, this decreased. And yeah, this generally went on decreasing. So the operation of the Privy Council, they, they worked as a team, and they had warrants and letters signed by every member. There was no chief minister, so there was no one who, made the, who played the role of Cromwell, who played the role of Wolsey, no one. And had this collective responsibility and corporate decision making. This, um, like, yeah, like I said, so they had to collaborate to work effectively. And this did work at the beginning of the reign. There was fixed membership, so it's not like anyone could go in and out. So they issued proclamations and administration orders in the name of the Queen. And they could rule by state paper through the issue of letters and warrants signed by the Board of the Privy Council collectively. Because they wanted to pass anything, they needed to work together. They couldn't just work independently. Now, like I mentioned, throughout Elizabeth's reign, the role of the Privy Council uh, ended up changing, along with the role of key individuals. Cecil um, increasingly saw himself as a public servant, or servant of the state, rather than a personal servant to Elizabeth. So he gained a lot of political power, rather than just personal power, personal loyalty to Elizabeth. Now, it was, it's quite silly to, to view the council as an institution because Elizabeth herself, she didn't see a Privy Council as like, an institution, obviously. She saw it as a, like, individual people and she knew who was there and sometimes even went outside of the Privy Council to seek advice. And then we have the whole royal court. Now, not only, like, not only the Privy Council allowed opportunities to um, expand the power of members of the Privy Council. So they could, they could expand their power through other means. The Royal Court had a lot to offer. And this Royal Court is not a palace or whatever, it's wherever the monarch, or the Queen in this case, have to be residing. This could be at one of her palaces, like I just said, or even a member of the nobility's house, during the Royal Progress. So she was staying at, say, Leicester's house. Now Leicester's house became the Royal Court. It was wherever the Queen was. There were two main areas, the Privy Chamber, which was more, more exclusive, and their power gradually decreases in the Tudor period, um, because some gentlemen of the Privy Chamber were not allowed access, and ladies of the, bed, ladies of the bedchamber um, had only minor political 
I think it means parachute. Oh, at least the bedroom only allowed minor political influence. They had the presence chamber, which had relatively easy access, and uh, those with considerable status or power could be like, granted access quite easily. Now, Elizabeth notably turned her courtiers into politicians, and this can be seen as with Dudley, Lester, same guy. Um, but she also managed to turn her politicians into courtiers, William Cecil. And I'll say William because later on, Robert Cecil, William Cecil's son, comes into play. Now, Elizabeth and Parliament. Well, um, Elizabeth rarely called on Parliament, which sat for overall less than three years and in the whole of her 45 year reign. And it was an only met 13 times. And she really used it to emphasize her like the role of royal prerogative and ruled really using other methods. So, what are the functions of parliament? First of all, we have lawmaking. Parliament passed 438 acts during the entirety of Elizabeth's reign. These, these could be religious acts like the Act of Supremacy or the Act of Uniformity, but also social acts like the Poor Relief. Parliament was also responsible for granting tax taxation. So, before, especially with Henry VII, there was a real distinction between ordinary and extraordinary revenue. The, the whole idea that extraordinary revenue should only be used for desperate times was, was lost under Henry VIII because he went to war so much, he was constantly used um, extraordinary revenue, so um, now extraordinary revenue just seemed like ordinary revenue. And well, Elizabeth had to rely on extraordinary, extraordinary revenue to pay for day-to-day -day expenses. And the financial reforms she implemented were not working. Now, up until the 1580s, early 1590s, this was all good because she could rely on those Mary put in place. But her own ones didn't work. Then the third role of Parliament was giving advice. And this is a traditional role of MPs. Now, Elizabeth became increasingly irritating with MPs who even dared venture in opinions in areas she considered to be royal prerogative. Now, this is marriage. When at marriage, whenever it was discussed, she closed Parliament. It was more useful in terms of communication and contact between the Privy Council and those who administered in the localities on their behalf, rather than of um, like passing any major legislation. Although obviously it was needed there, and there were a few disagreements with Elizabeth in Parliament, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Well, what are the interpretations? I'm now I'm gonna gloss over this, well not gloss over this, but I'm gonna like read it quite not in that much detail because I'm gonna get, uh, get into the whole Neil debate by the end. Well, there is an uh, interpretation is that there is a centrality in English history of the House of Commons. And there's this Puritan choir of MPs which were determined to use Parliament to promote Puritanism. Now there was a disagreement as to uh, the very existence of this whole Puritan choir among historians because as little as 20 MPs in the House of Commons could be considered radicals, and only four of them were merry and exiles. Parliament was not really dominated by any one group, and it was not the main, it was not even the main platform for pushing across any kind of view. And even if Elizabeth dislike was, was being discussed, she just shut it down. Yeah, Parliament was uh, important, but only really occasionally important with the whole of raising revenue and passing legislation. And it was more of a, in Elizabeth's reign, it was more of a secondary feature of, of, in politics because it required man, um, management by members of the Privy Council, so the Privy Council was the main legislative body. Um, the parliamentary management best illustrates details of Elizabethan politics, so, so yeah. Um, then the whole crown, well, the crown devoted a lot of energy um, into ensuring the house was packed with supporters. So um, this meant that the house was of critical importance and even 62, 62 new boroughs were created during Elizabeth's reign. And well, traditionalists do say that this is to pack the house with supportive MPs, but revisionists, they claim that these seats were created because of the pressure of the council by the local gentry, who had the prestige it came with being the whole member of the commons. Also, the gentry, they were rewarded with the support with the, their supporters 
The gentry rewarded their supporters through the appointment to Parliament, and this was the next whole example of the patronage system. Cecil himself, William Cecil, he played a really important role in the whole de deliberation with the Commons, and even pre prepared the legis legislative program. This was assisted by Axel's manager, um, Hatton. Then the whole tone of Parliament. This was set up. Uh, this was set by a Privy Councilor. So whatever the tone was, whatever they would be discussing, this was set up by by a Privy Council. And it outlined the Crown's priorities at the beginning of each Parliament. Then the Speaker was elected by the Crown and the Council, and Privy Councilors nominated a candidate that would be put up for the Speaker, and the Council decided that this was a suitable candidate or not and if they were likely to act in the Crown's best interest. The Speaker of the House of Commons is the most important role in it, I think. Apart, like, not, like, back then, there was no Prime Minister, so now it is the Prime Minister, but back then it was the Speaker. The Queen also adopted a much less subtle approach when, it, when she thought the royal prerogative was being infringed, and just restrained this to just two parliaments, that in 1563 and 1566. This is when the issue of succession and marriage came up. She also uh, deemed royal administration to be um, an issue of royal prerogative. So parliamentary sessions. Right, I'm gonna like I'm gonna divide this because um, there is I talk about one parliament in the second half of her reign. So this is just up until the first half. So I'm gonna cut up. Uh, I'm gonna cut it at 1571. So don't. Don't think I've forgotten the rest. Well, but the first, the first parliament is obviously the fifteen fifty nine parliament, which was to settle the whole issue of, of religion when Elizabeth came to the throne. The settlement was pushed through thanks to the efforts of Protestant councillors such as Cecil himself, um, in the face of conservative opposition in the House of Lords. Then the whole fifteen sixty three to fifteen sixty six sixty seven parliament, in which Elizabeth just said, "Hey guys." I need money. The MPs wanted to settle the the issue of marriage and, and succession, but Elizabeth herself she thought this was a whole like royal prerogative. In 1563, the MPs openly pressed the issue. Then in 1566, they were kind of more subtle. But in 1566, that same year, Elizabeth opposed um, the passage of bills to push for the reforms and close parliament. Then we have the whole 1571 parliament. Well, this was a uh, call to strengthen the, the treason law and laws against Catholics in light of the whole excommunication thing, which had happened the year before. Elizabeth also wanted a subsidy to, to pay for the suppression of the whole Northern Earls Rebellion in 1569. The Parliament did grant the subsidy and did agree to support the tightening of, of the laws. Now, an MP named Strickland he proposed the reform of the Book of Common Prayer, which is uh, quite upset the, the Queen and the Royal Council, and the Privy Council, sorry, and he was removed from, uh, from attending the House of Commons by the Council. Um, there were quite a few of them, however, um, members like MPs, who were hoping to secure more moderate religious change. Okay. So, internal challenges to Elizabeth's security. Well, first we have the whole marriage succession and the crisis of 1562. So of course, let's start with, with marriage. Well, Elizabeth had the status as an unmarried woman and today she's known as the Virgin Queen. Uh, well, because she was married, this prompted a lot of discussions as to whether, as to who she would marry. This decision was quite controversial because it was not only an infringement of royal prerogative, but also who would the man be? It couldn't be an Englishman because his family would undoubtedly benefit, factions at court would, would ensue, and it would take power from Elizabeth herself and dominate her in politics. It could most definitely not be a Catholic because he would try to enforce a counter-reformation in England. It could also not be a Protestant because it would highlight a religion in the powerhouses, like for the powerhouses of the continent, and possibly result in another armada. It could also not be a foreigner because well, England was extremely xenophobic, and this can be seen with William, not William, with Mary and Philip. And the whole religion question remains, like, were they Catholic, were they Protestant? 
in terms of succession, well, if she wanted to like have a stable dynasty, she needed to produce an heir, which we now know she never did. If she died young, she would uh, there would be a minor, a minor king, and factions like those during, uh, factions during Edward's reign would ensue. So the sooner she had a son, the more time it would give for her to live before her son turned eighteen, and then if she were to die, then the son would just like rule with no need of a protector. Then the whole crisis of fifteen sixty two. Well, in autumn of that year, Elizabeth contracted smallpox, and it looked really bad. It looked like she was going to die. Now, none of the possible heirs uh, looked good. You have Mary Queen of Scots, who was a Catholic, so that was a no-no. Then Catherine Grey, she was in space, and, well, any nobles with royal connections, they had very little support. Um, now, when Elizabeth got better, things didn't exactly improve. Parliament did debate the issue of marriage and succession heavily in 1563. Um, Elizabeth just kept on remaining firm on her. It's royal prerogative, you should not discuss this, it's me who should be talking about this. But even though she did this, the issue didn't go away. So now you have Northern Earth's rebellion and then Elizabeth's government's response to the rebellion. I'm not going to talk about the rebellion because it's not really um, relevant to this course, but the government's response is. Well, they were quite effective, they crushed this, um, and the government worked. Because the servants acted on the spot, and they were sensible, and they tried communic- um, they tried- like, they were successful in trying in circumstances, and they did try, like, a good ways of defeating the rebels, yes. Um, uh, Cecil studied maps constantly to work out the best, like, tactical advantage, it, it, however, it was kind of difficult to raise troops in these tough situations. Elizabeth um, increasingly relied on Leicester, and he eventually ended up distancing himself from the Conservatives, and therefore limiting his own options. The government also showed a general lack of comprehension of the difference between the North and the South, so that would go on to cause problems, and it highlighted how ruthless Elizabeth's government was. In dealing with opposition. She had these mass executions which weren't good. I mean, for her propaganda purposes, I'm guessing. Then we had the whole crown government in Parliament. So, by the middle part of her reign, Elizabeth was more secure, especially in the seventies, especially. Uh, she had overcome the 1569 rebellion, and then in 1572, she was right at the height of all her powers. Um, the whole role of ministers and factions, well, Cecil was Lord Burghley, I, I had that right. He was by far the most influential of Elizabeth's ministers, and by 1572, he was Lord Treasurer. He coordinated the Privy Council, even managed Parliament, supervised the Exchequer, and even um, supervised the, the Court of Guards, of Wards, sorry. And he had a more prudent attitude to money. Then, he had the whole Privy Council. Well, the conservative influence in the Privy Council generally fell in the 1570s with the deaths of Norfolk and Winchester and Sussex. There was this inner ring of councillors which were mostly militant Protestants, so that was that. But, um, like, especially in the later years, um, changing personnel, well, this didn't really affect the council. And they refused to agree, they just didn't like, agree on. If she should marry a French man, I'm gonna get into this in a second. Um, and then with the whole issue of Mary Queen of Scots, uh, well, they fell out. Um, Elizabeth and the Privy Council just fell out. So now, very much like with Mary, there were problems with succession. By 1573, um, Elizabeth was 40, so she was too old to have children. In 1779. She, well, she opened marriage negotiations with the French Duke of Anjou. Uh, she was declared capable of having children, which was kind of good, but if she were to die in childbirth, like I mentioned, she would leave under a minor rule, ruler, and now, if because she had married a French guy, he would be under the influence of the French. So the council was incredibly worried. Then, how long during the next period? There were five sessions of parliament between 
1571 and 1587. Because before those three, that like Parliament and Elizabeth can be divided into into like three periods: the beginning, the middle, and the end. Three, five, um, and five. Yes. Well, there was a whole refusal of royal assent to bills that had passed both both houses, and Elizabeth had refused over sixty bills. Fifteen of them just in 1585. Sorry about that. Then in 1572, that was one of the sections, sessions of Parliament, the MPs were called for the execution of Norfolk and Mary Queen of Scots. Now, Norfolk was executed, but Mary was, was spared because Elizabeth straight up refused to sign anything that had to deal with her execution. Then in 1576, there was a recall of the 1572 Parliament. Wentworth was even imprisoned for the infringement of the royal prerogative because he did talk of marriage and succession. In 1576, I, was, that, I mentioned that. In 1581, there was a whole another recall of the 1572 Parliament. New anti Catholic laws were, strength, were strengthened and there was a subsidy that was granted in case of any trouble arising. Then, in 1584, um, this parliament was caused at the time of the assassination of William of Orange, this William of Orange not being the same William of Orange who would go on to be William III. This also, like with the 1581 um, one, is strengthened uh, anti-Catholic laws. And acts were passed declaring that the Jesuits and other Catholic uh, priests were, were traitors. And then, 1586, 1587, this was Parliament for Mary Queen of Scots issue. Um, they debated the issue of if Mary Queen of Scots should be let, like imprisoned, that she was already imprisoned, kept in prison, or just straight up executed. Now Elizabeth said, "Okay, fine. This is trespassing the royal prerogative. But I'll give you give you this." And she sought advice. She procrastinated on it and ended up signing the death warrant, although she didn't mean for anyone to see it. Um, she's like just like. Having it, there, having it there, but Parliament, I mean Parliament members, um, well they um, like they caught the warrant and like hand it in, and I mean Mary was executed, and Elizabeth just couldn't do anything about it because I mean she signed it, so she can take it back. Um, so that is like like Parliament and the Crown and whatever, and now we have local government. So first of all, we have the Anglo-Scottish border. It was the only land border with a foreign state, so the only, like, England is an, an island, obviously. Um, and the only foreign state being there, uh, not Wales, uh, Wales, I do believe, is under the control of the English. But um, Scotland was the only country, country that shared a land border. Ireland was part, no, I was saying, no, no, no. Um, obviously, Ireland was a separate country, but... Um, it was, it's a separate mini island, I know I said that. And then the next main big huge country that was kind of close was France, but there was the English Channel between them. So with the Anglo-Scottish border, the whole breaking of the Northern nobility in 1569 meant that Elizabeth had to keep on placing outsiders, so people not from the north, in the north, um, in key roles. Now, Southerners did not like this, and they even resented Elizabeth for putting them in the north, because it was regarded as being inhospitable and wild. Also, Northerners associate, were associated with a huge factional rivalry and general corruption. And there was constant unease in regards, of, in regards to border control. Then we have Northern counties. Um, now that was with the whole Scottish, uh, Anglo-Scottish border, now we have Northern country, uh, counties. These were under the jurisdiction of the Council of the North, which was reinstated in 1569. Came had an independent council and didn't need um, the, to report to the Privy Council, and they had an agency for the Crown's authority. This is also like in with the Council of Wales, same thing. Um, um, yeah, Sussex was deemed to have failed uh, in handling this whole of the North, because, you know, the whole Northern Rebellion broke out, so he was replaced by Huntington in 1572. And then you have the Assize uh, Judges, and these were royal judges that traveled as a circuit, and visited the country around twice a year. They, uh, like, these were seen and regarded as important social, not only social, but also legal occasions, and they tried both civil and criminal cases. 
they had the power of outdoing and things that ordinary judges just couldn't do. Well, for example, finding JP, justices of the peace. Um, also, they ensured royal authority was being held in every county. So they, they were a way of Elizabeth TV control. This was also used by her ministers, most notably the Lord Chancellor and um, Lord Keeper, to pass on advice and instructions. But the Keeper only tended to do this during times of crisis, so during the social dislocation of the 1590s. Then the whole Lord Lieutenant, um, well, they had been used before, but increased sort of invasion, especially from 1585 onwards, increased their role, and they were more prominent. Each lieutenant had several shires under their own control, and they delegated um, some of their power to leading gentry from each individual council, and they were assisted by master captains. They had an effective structure for the organization of local defense, so that was quite good. And that is the first half of Elizabeth's reign. Um, now we have the second half, the last years of Elizabeth, going from 1588 to 1603, her death. So, factions and the decline of government. So first, the decline of Elizabeth's authority. Well, Elizabeth, at this point, was getting old. Her tactics of flirting with men just were not working because she had been wearing a lot of makeup, which was like, like with lead, so her face was like, horrible. So she can use this flirty techniques. Now, counselors were told that they needed to pretend like they were in love with her. So that was not good, I'm guessing. Well, all her good ministers had died in the 1580s and early 1590s, and the replacements that came after this were just not as good and did not function as effectively as those who had been in the Elizabethan Golden Age were. Um, war became more and more expensive because it kept on dragging on. Um, because Elizabeth just didn't, especially with Spain, Elizabeth didn't want this war to keep on going, but it just kept on going. And there was a whole increase in taxes, and um, monopolies were abused, which caused a huge deterioration in the relationships between Crown and Parliament. Now, factional rivalries became really intense. These were uncontrolled and were outside of government. Um, and also, but like, like the factual rivalry, like I said, they went outside the Privy Council, they went outside Parliament. And bad harvests were increasing, especially in the 1590s, which led to a, a food, food crisis and widespread uncertainty in regards to the succession. So, quality of government. In terms of deaths, well, there were many, many deaths. And like, like I said, of um, prominent councillors, Dudley died in 1588 which really struck um, Elizabeth hard. Then the Mildmay died in 1589, Walsingham and Croft both died in 1590, and Hudson died in 1591. Now, by 1597, the Privy Council was just 11 people. So it was quite small. Cecil, as he was getting old, William Cecil, um, taught his son, Robert Cecil, his, like, everything he knew, and became eventually the new protégé, which would cause problems for Robert, Robert Cecil because it anger, angered the Earl of Essex, who coincidentally was the stepson of Robert Dudley. So when I talk, when, I'll, when I'm when I'm going to talk about the faction factionalism, I'll mention this again. And the replacements of these prominent uh, politicians were usually middle-aged sons of these old ministers, however, these lacked the father's skills and were no longer the leading no nobleman. And then in terms of taxation, well, there was the kind of yield in of taxation, and they still used the Marian Book of Rates, 1558. I, I mentioned this, um, which was up outdated because this is like they still use this by I don't know 1588, so it was over 30 years old, and they needed to update it, but they just didn't, and well, it used yields from parliamentary subsidies, which weren't there anymore. It wasn't accurate. Then, 1590, things really came to a head. Elizabeth, uh, well, she rarely resorted um, to going for to finance her wars because she they were really costly and she didn't want to depend too much on Parliament. But like I said, these wars were costly, and the crown was just not wasn't just wasn't used to financing these long wars. Like these started in 1558 and went on rapidly until her death. 
and it did achieve its goals in the Netherlands, especially with the whole um, the Protestant pockets of support in terms of like in Spanish territory. I'm going to talk about this in a second, so don't worry. But yeah, uh, the whole taxation thing, and especially with the wars and any military campaigns, that wasn't good for the economy. And then in terms of Parliament, well, relationships between Parliament and the Queen generally remained good. Um, that was up until anyone tried to interfere with Elizabeth's royal prerogative. Like I said, Elizabeth had a really strong sense of royal prerogative and she lost her temper when anyone infringed it. This is kind of Essex. Um, I'll mention Essex in a, in a while. Um, well, the whole issue of monopolies were a catalyst for a breakdown in relations. And it just showed how Robert Cecil, even though, yeah, he was, he was the son of, Robert, of William Cecil, he just wasn't as good. And he just shows the lack of resources he had compared to his father. And then, in 1601, the whole Essex Rebellion happened, and the House, was, the House of Commons, especially, was chaotic, but then it came under control, and then the whole golden speech was given by Elizabeth. So a quick summary of factionalism at this point. This is not even like the whole thing. I'm gonna talk about the whole reign of factionalism in a second. But factionalism at this point was just two men. Essex versus Robert Cecil. Now, I just find it funny because factionalism in the first half of Elizabeth's reign was Dudley, like Lester versus Cecil. Now in the second half of her reign, it was Essex versus Cecil. Essex being Lester's Dudley's um, yes, son-in-law or stepson, stepson, yes, I said it before, yes, I said it before, so yeah, but then Cecil being um, yes, son-in-law, yeah, and then Cecil being the son of William Cecil, so they were kind of related, so kind of interesting. Well, Essex and late. 1590s became paranoid of uh, Essex of Cecil um, because, and they, this clouded his political judgment and well and in fact his policies and well Essex did end up being decapitated. Well William Cecil held the most important way to gain patronage. Um, this was like his way of gaining patronage but he did just didn't abuse it uh, because he knew he could like eventually caused it destabilization in government. And he, as time went on and as Cecil was getting older, he increasingly handed his role over to his son. But Robert Cecil, he was less inclined to keep the balance and he overlooked Essex, which just left him poorer and eventually angrier, which was not good, and ended up in the whole Essex Rebellion. Well, Essex faction he was really concerned about Cecil's family monopoly, like, uh, of Parliament. He wanted to be like his stepfather, not, not father, no, sorry. So, so, um, yes, Lester Dudley, same guy, um, he was the stepfather of, of, of Essex. I said that wrong before, stepfather, just want to put that out there. Um, he also built out the following of notable nobles. Like the Bacon brothers, um, he like he also like they also felt overlooked, and they were attracted by the favors he would he promised them. If you support me and I'll I'll like um, support my policies, I'll pass these, and these will benefit you. And he also had like several attempts to gain power, which just proved, proved to be disastrous. In nineteen ninety three, he um, sought an office for Francis Bacon, but he was rebuffed. And Cecil even suggested uh, Bacon be put forward for the consolation prize. But Essex lost his temper now. It just shows how Essex had like no skill like as a political figure because this was still a good like political position. It just wasn't the one he wanted, but it was still a really good one. Also, Essex completely failed in Cadiz in 1597 and he really gambled his financial future because he essentially ignored orders to seek his own financial gain. He left Ford at uh, one point and just didn't return, but only did so because he was appointed Earl Marshal. 
and he continued uh, pushing for war. For his own glory, despite the fact that Cecil wanted peace, and Elizabeth wanted him to save money, so obviously she would listen to Cecil. But Essex just kept on pushing for war. He was appointed Lord, Lord Lieutenant of Ireland in 1598, but failed, and then the whole Essex Rebellion of 1601 happened. Now I think I mentioned this in a second, but I'm just gonna say it now before I forget. Um, at one point, most likely Essex just burst into the chain, chamber and. This is not seen very well because you can't really burst into the Queen's chamber and ended up being slapped by Elizabeth. Quite literally, she slaps him. But then he also like came out with this whole rebellion against her, well not against her, against Cecil. And well he falls from power and his head falls from his body. So um that is uh, factionalism in the second half. Now I'm gonna like I said, I'm gonna do a whole summary at the end. Now, Hope caught in Parliament during 1588 to 1603, it was only called four times. Yes, four times. I said five before, sorry, four times. The management became even more and more difficult because there was a whole decline in the quality of the Privy Council, like I said, because the politicians were just were not good and financial demands uh, increased uh, when harvests were, were just not good. In the 1590s, harvests were terrible. And well, the whole Marian reforms just had to run out. And the whole monopolies issue. So, for our parliament of 1589, it was concerned with raising revenues for the war with Spain. And the Commons voted the Queen as a double subsidy pay. It, it gave the Queen a double subsidy pay over four years. In 1593, legislation um, was passed concerning refusants. It was just, it, uh, there was some opposition to a bill uh, which went against some. Um, Protestant secretaries and Wentworth, who just keeps on getting imprisoned, uh, got imprisoned yet again for raising the issue of succession because the guy just didn't know when to shut up. The guy just raised the issue of succession. I think this is the third time he was imprisoned. He he raised the issue of succession. He got imprisoned. He got out. Went back to the House of Commons. Raised the issue again. Got imprisoned. Got let out. Where's it? Okay. Can he learn? Um, yeah, and then 1597 1598 Parliament, uh, Elizabeth really, really, really just really needed the money and, um, like, just needed money and even introduced the poor laws. And then, um, like, yeah, she introduced the poor law, and well, there were so many controversies regarding monopolies. In 1601, there were many moments about monopolies, like, the whole monopolies issue was huge. Uh, but she did manage to calm things down and using the whole golden speech, which was very charming and saying, Hey guys in Parliament, you guys are doing an amazing job. Yes, you guys are doing great. Just like, can we do this? But you guys are awesome. Yeah. So it was kind of flattery for her own game. So, Monopoly's issue. 1597 was a terrible year. There were a lot of poor harvests, which led to an increase in, in food prices which ended up resulting in a food crisis. Uh, and there was there is a lot of evidence showing how starvation was widespread. Your real incomes were decreasing, but like this meant that the government couldn't really ask for any taxes because they were quite unpopular. And well, monopolies were given to councillors. Now monopolies, these mean that they got all the income from a certain area. So, for example, court composers had a monopoly over the sale of music papers. So that was like, they were the only ones who could gain from it. Essex himself, he did have a monopoly over sweet wine. And however, this was less defensible. Now, finances became more and more desperate. Now, the crown depended on the sale of monopolies to finance itself. Which led to increased prices in some areas. Um, so those who were holding a monopoly, they just made as much money as possible. But in 1601, however, the Crown's critics essentially gained control of Parliament. And they were organized and detailed, and in the end, did get their way. The most, the most popular monopolies were revoked by the Royal Proclamation. And like again, she mentioned this yet again in the Golden Speech. So, continuing doubts over the succession. Uh, 
what worth i uh, you have probably heard me say his name a thousand times well he was constantly punished for voicing doubts over the succession in parliament like i've mentioned him a hundred times because like i said the guy just did not want to shut up about about succession it was royal prerogative and elizabeth did not like it being in print well everybody wanted to remain in favor of, of her like her successor well it but the problem is they didn't know who it was so they couldn't really suck up to them also essex he kind of knew that he had an idea of what it could be and he was beginning in contact with james the sixth of scotland he had been um doing this for some time uh robert cecil also did this uh from 1601 onward um essex did it first because at this point there was no heir Elizabeth was getting old, and they didn't know Elizabeth was going to die in 1603. It's not like, oh my god, it's only two years left. But still, like, yeah. There were quite, like, it's not like James was the only possible successor. There were 12 possibilities who, who would be successor. And, but like, James VI was generally the, like, the person who was most widely accepted. He was Protestant, he generally had the best claim. And he had two sons uh, who would, he could pass the throne on to, Charles the first. He was the son he passed the throne on to when James came to the throne in 1603. He died in 1625, Charles came to the throne, and the whole civil war. That, that's not really relevant. But even by 1601, Elizabeth, uh, she kept on refusing to name a successor. There is this quite a bit of uncertainty as to whether Elizabeth did or did not sign the papers on her deathbed naming James as her successor. Then by the end, like when she was dying, um, she lost all control and significance because she just wasn't prominent enough. And all eyes, just instead of going to Elizabeth because they knew she would die soon, they turned to the man who would, who would probably succeed her, James, and they began courting him. So, well, Elizabeth's gradual decline was a huge godsend to Cecil. He was, uh, he was able to recognize she was on her way out, and he even made arrangements ahead of the time for the succession of James VI. Now, he could, he could like, kind of do this because, well, Essex by this point was out of the way because he literally was dead. So he was the main politician, not because his father was, but still. And so he could and had kind of arranged the whole succession thing. And the whole documents had already been agreed by the time Elizabeth had signed them or did not didn't sign them. And you have to note how this whole succession thing was quite smooth, considering the reign lasted um, forty five years and it was quite tumultuous. So, uh, and like a lot of the credit has to be given to Cecil, Robert Cecil. So the whole succession thing was dealt quite effectively. Then, so by 1603, the whole unity question um, is like, was there unity? Well, there kind of was because, well, there was no real uprising against Elizabeth since the Northern Earls Rebellion. And the political nation were quite loyal to her, surprisingly. I don't think it's really common. And the religious situation was quite favorable. Um, Catholicism was on decline and Protestantism uh, was increasing. Those who were Catholic didn't have any real leadership who could pose a threat to Elizabeth and any successors. And well, by 1603, there was quite a certain degree of religious unity. So there was no real extremes on either side. There was no, and there were Puritans, obviously, and then extreme Catholics. But most people were right in the moderate area, especially those Catholics. They still, like, publicly either didn't, as long as they public didn't advertise how Catholic they were, they could live their lives. Yeah, um, and the church, I mean, it wasn't, like, in need of reform, majorly, I mean, the base of the church is still in place. The financial position was weak in 1603, however, but, and it was 22 years of war, and then when James the Sixth of Scotland, now first of England, um, inherited the kingdom, it was quite, quite stable. Um, but he had work to do. And the church, even though like religiously it didn't have any major um, like 
like the church theory didn't have to be reformed. The church, I guess, an institution. So that was what James did, but obviously we do not need to know about James. So, factionalism, I promised you I would tell you about it. So, there are four major instances. First three of them are Leicester and Cecil. Last one is Essex and Cecil. Different Cecil. So, first of all, Mary Pino Scots. 1562, uh, when the whole um, crisis happened, well, council disagreed over her wish to meet Mary because she did want to meet her, but she, they never did. Um, and unlike the film Mary Gino Scott says, well, they never, they've never met. 1969, Cecil and her followers um, urged for an intervention, but Cecil said, hey, why don't you guys have an agreement? And in 1586, well, Mary was found to be complicit in a plot to assassinate Elizabeth, which kind of helped secure Mary's execution. So that was that. Then you have the Netherlands. This was controlled by the Spanish, but there were Protestant pockets in, around like, the Netherlands. Leicester said, hey, let's send troops, let's help these Protestants. Cecil was like, no, let's just like, do nothing. Now Elizabeth took seven years to actually make a decision, and she ended up sending troops. And then we have the whole issue of marriage. There were two main, like, there were many, like, People who could be, even Philip of Spain, he said, hey, you want to get married? But it wasn't because he went to power, it was just because, well, he had been married to, his, to her sister, so why not? So the two main ones, which were uh, cause factionalism, were 1567, the Archduke Charles of Austria, and then 1578, 79 to 1581, whole French Duke of Alison and Anjou. Um, well, um, they both wanted to marry Elizabeth. And they were both approved by Cecil, but they were both rejected by Leicester because A, they would reduce his own power because he was the favorite of the queen. And also because we don't know if they had an affair or not, if that be Leicester was the queen's lover. Well, maybe he just didn't want Elizabeth to marry because he just didn't want Elizabeth to marry, even though he himself was married, despite his wife dying of suspicious circumstances. There was quite a lot of public uh, unrest regarding the French Duke, also with the Archduke, but also especially with the French Duke, um, also because he was Catholic and he was French and he had, but he did have ties to the royal family. So Elizabeth just ended up avoiding the marriage, with the excuse of this public unrest. And then the whole Essex versus Cecil thing, I'm just gonna do a quick like, run over it. 1593, Essex was admitted to the council and did a whole secret negotiation with James VI. To form a Protestant coalition against Catholics. James was obviously um, Protestant. 1596, Cecil wanted to make peace with Spain since they had made peace with France. But Cecil just used his appointees to just go over Essex, so Essex was kind of ignored. In 1601, Essex just burned to the Queen's Chamber um, after this whole disastrous military campaign in Ireland. But um, she didn't renew the patent for, and like she also didn't move, uh, renew the patent for his monopoly on sweet wine, which angered him, and then he caused a whole rebellion, especially against Cecil, not only against Elizabeth. But uh, yeah, I mean, he does, he was tried and executed. So the whole conclusion of Elizabeth's reign, well, and really on the Tudor period, well, by the time of Elizabeth's death in 1603. England was arguably in a much better position than it had been at the time of her accession. The crown was much like, it had, it had been strengthened. There was now a national unity. England did appear quite confident. It was at the brink of achieving an overseas empire. The whole like, British, like, they had started colonizing the US and not the US. Northern America. Now, this was nowhere near the US. And if I am not mistaken, people like Sir Francis Drake, they were involved in this. And the colony of Virginia was named after her. Then, um, well, succession was kind of, was smooth and hit free, so that was really good. When Elizabeth got to the throne, she had to deal with issues that by Henry, whilst um, the government, well, she was also governing a, like, a seamless powerless government compared to like France and Spain. Like England was powerful, but when you compare it to the powerhouses of where France and Spain, well not as much. She was strong and most of the time she was quite decisive despite the whole Netherlands incident which happened, I forgot to say, in 1578. 
um, uh, he was, had the farsightedness of being the first ruler to, uh, to perceive the possibility of increasing national power and prestige through developing the empire. And yes, he didn't see the effects of the British Empire, but as we all know, it, we ended up, I think it was one quarter of the globe ended up being under the British Empire. And yes, it is still England. Britain doesn't officially become formed up until 1707. And even when James comes to the throne, even though he is both King of England and Scotland, that is, does not mean he was King of Britain. That, come, that comes under Queen Anne. Well, um, there was, a, like, our, the whole appearance of national unity was kind of an illusion. Like, I mentioned national unity, but... Hmm. Well, religious divisions still existed, but, like, they were decreasing, but they were still there. There was still Catholicism versus Protestantism. Yeah, kind of like were a thing of the past, tales of the elderly, but they were still there. And well, Protestantism had been in place for 45 years, especially like, Elizabeth died and kept on being there, but they were, like, Catholics were still there. Um, and like, it's just because people had, were born and died Protestant without knowing anything else. But those who had Catholic families, well, they, they remained Catholic at heart. I guess. Um, also, the relationship between the crown and the people held true. There were many resources for maintaining law and order, um, but these didn't reach like huge extent. And England was still mostly ordered in terms of society in Europe. Uh, well, the people had held together when defending the queen, and the whole Marfrelet tracts were considered treasonous, and they were dealt with. Elizabeth's reign is seen as a triumph, um, but this thing is like massive oversimplification. There were a lot of successes, but there were still failures. And yeah, these successes outweigh the failures, but you can't exactly ignore the failures. Um, so yeah, she does deserve to be amongst the greatest of English monarchs, and because she was clear sighted and wise, and she knew what she was doing. So, just this last part I'm going to talk about. Is the whole meal debate. So I mentioned this before, so now I'm gonna like give the whole debate. So um, this is like was there a pure Puritan choir in the House of Commons and this whole did like the Parliament increase in power at the end. Anyway, so the proposition, so like saying that yes, there was a Puritan choir and Parliament increased in in um, in power. Oh, uh, let me find one thing. Um, like it was like an increase in influence, not power. Um, they, they agree with it. Well, the provision, uh, like introduction argument is that there was a Puritan choir. Um, a group of people were trying to put constant pressure um, on Elizabeth to try and affect policy and swing the balance of power in their in their own favor. They challenged her on many aspects, including money and, mar and marriage, whole matter of royal, royal prerogative. So Wentworth. Um, this led to more claims, uh, such as also freedom of speech and growing consciousness on the idea of debate in the country. And it was really successful in implementing certain issues like Mary King of Scots and pushing for a Church of England. And it did lay the groundwork for the stronger parliament of the 17th century. But the opposition that said that there wasn't a Puritan choir and the parliament didn't increase in influence was that Elizabeth, like they say that Elizabeth was always was clearly in ultimate control over politics. They, she used the power of veto and royal assent to push things through. She literally gained anything she asked for, and she was granted every single subsidy she, yeah, she asked. Um, the Parliament's debates usually reflected the Queen's views anyway. This monopoly crisis is promoted by the Queen, um, and also the, uh, reflected the whole idea of count of, uh, of um, privy council. Parliament was really just fulfilling its role while discussing socio-economic and religious issues. They never posed any real challenge to, to the Queen's power. So, point one for the proposition would be that Parliament were, went beyond the traditional powers than it should have. So the argument here is that um, they challenged her on marriage. This is an issue of royal prerogative, like I said. There was direct defiance of an issue that only she had power of. I mean, Wentworth, Cope, and three others were constantly being arrested for casual conversations made outside of Parliament about religious reforms, 
suggests that even though these were casual conversations not made in Parliament, it just shows how she thought they were a threat. And if she thought they were a threat, then this meant that Parliament had increased in influence. However, the position argues that Parliament was just merely continuing in the role that it always had. The Queen had still had the power, and she used this, um, to open and close Parliament, so to control her, um, their voice. One of, also, one of their main roles was to discuss issues that mattered in the country, so they were just serving the, the, the country. And there was even less freedom of speech that had been under Henry VIII. Um, Elizabeth was like, happy to exercise her power of rest when she pleased or needed to, but she didn't like, use it too much. It was like Elizabeth's decision, not Parliament. Like, yeah. Um, but also, just because Parliament raised an issue doesn't mean it had, had power over her. So the whole marriage thing, well, they raised the issue, but they just didn't, like, she didn't pull through. She didn't, like, say, okay, fine, I'm going to marry someone just because you say so. This was a close uh, Parliament and had prominent members arrested. One. So point two, the idea of proposition, was that there was a direct, consistent, and uh, obvious challenge to put pressure on religious policies and issues relating to royal prerogative. So, and this is like whole uh, Stickland's opposition to policy, and then the whole subsequent debate on freedom of, of yeah, freedom of debate, freedom of speech, the whole fifteen sixty five prophesying crisis, and fifteen sixty nine Stubbs's pamphlet opposing marriage to the whole um to Alison and Andrew. Um, maybe that's seventy nine. I think that's seventy nine. Yeah, because yes, seventy nine, not sixty nine. These went beyond the traditional challenges made to previous monarchs in prior reigns. Like we don't see this under Henry or like Edward or Mary or Henry, no Henry. Um, and also its emphasis of a uh, start of a changing power of parliament that would continue to grow up until the Civil War. And this is the Stuarts, so we're not really like we don't need to know that in detail, but Parliament like there was a whole civil war that went was king against Parliament. The opposition, however, argues that Elizabeth retained absolute control over Parliament all throughout her reign. She did, like I said, have the power to open and close it, and she only called them when she needed them. Eleven out of, like, she, like, they called them a bunch of times to raise taxes. She vetoed overall 60 acts, and 15 of them in 1585 alone. She set the agenda on what was, would be discussed, and 1585 straight up banned all the discussion on religious policy. But there was still some opposition, but it, like, it still went ahead. Also, the Privy Council was present in all sessions, but like, it was just like pressure on them. Like, the Privy Councilors were there, it, would, it put more and more pressure on MPs. Um, it was like, we put more pressure on their fear of censure and lack of patronage. Also, the Privy Council put their own representatives in Parliament through patronage, thus putting her own like, her policies. So Elizabeth selected those in the Privy Council, and they, they in turn, uh, like, gave people in Parliament, like, things to discuss. She, she also reduced the House of Lords to only 55 people, and then the House of Commons. And the last point for the proposition would be that Elizabeth's Parliament saw a continuation of an increasing power of Parliament. This really starts under Henry VIII, and had three roles, including royal supremacies for Henry VIII, succession, and, um, it, they even declared Elizabeth Queen before Mary's Parliament were dissolved. It was quite active. They passed 438 acts, including poor laws and other social uh, economic legislation. They challenged the Queen, getting 12 monopolies and old. And, well, this was based on royal prerogative, and they still did it. So it just shows how they had an increase in influence. However, the opposition would argue that the Queen consistently overruled Parliament and the Privy Council initiated the, the final decisions on a number of issues. In 1559, the whole issue of the restoration of royal supremacy over the Church, which was rejected by Parliament, but it was still pushed through. Then in 1566, the um, Privy Council uh, delegation for succession, because they, like, they said, okay, we can't discuss this here, so we're gonna, you can discuss it in Parliament. So. That's that. In 1571, after the whole Northern Rebellion and excommunication and like by for Cotton, then Nullis, like, this is the whole decision of Mary King of Scots, that whole thing happened. And then 1587, the whole agreement to the execution of Mary. 
Oh, then I forgot, there's a fourth point, sorry. The proposition would argue that Elizabeth relied on Parliament for essential things, such as extraordinary revenue. She was willing um, and able to call them on key issues because she knew their importance and she knew that she couldn't get this extraordinary revenue without Parliament support, which just shows how they have been increasing in influence. Eleven of the thirteen times she called Parliament was to request revenue. And this was just to pay for ordinary expenses. She called them to discuss foreign issues such as war with Spain. And in 1589, uh, they discussed monopolies and to call unrest provoked by Parliament themselves. You can't deny how like, they were had increased influence. However, the opposition would argue that the period after Elizabeth's reign has been disproportionately exaggerated, and like, the power of Parliament is just its not that bad, not much. The whole idea of revolutionary Parliament is only because of the whole civil war. But this just like, this is many years before, so you can't really say that Parliament was revolutionary because, I mean, yes, the idea is based on the Civil War, but the Civil War obviously hasn't happened yet, and it will only happen under Charles I, not Elizabeth I. It's anachronistic to see Elizabeth's Parliament in the eyes of the latter per of the later period, and, um, well, they're, like, they're able to, and willing to punish and resist pressure, so Strickland and the whole marriage issue. So, in conclusion, and I'm almost done, I swear, um, the proposition says that, well, Parliament continued to gain powers from the 1550s, 1550s onwards. Well, you, this is due to Mary and Exile's different ideas of government. Um, they, denied, they were denied speaking time by Elizabeth, but still had a great impact despite Elizabeth's attempts to censure them. The whole Puritan choir was being led by uh, Peter Wentworth, who, as we all know, I mean, he got arrested a bunch of times. But the fact that he came, kept on coming back just shows how he is still um, important and Parliament still had a lot of influence. There were leading confrontations which could have been unimaginable in such a system of personal monarchy. If Elizabeth was like, if Parliament didn't have that much of an influence, why would a person be needed to be arrested three times? Like, the, like I said, the president of Wentworth just shows how much of a threat he was. And he was also arrested for discussing the whole Mary Queen of Scots thing, so he was arrested a bunch of times. Parliamentary provocation culminated in the instigation of public unrest by the 1590s. And the argument is not they were more powerful, it's that their influence grew. So yes, the Queen was all, like the most powerful out of all of them, you know, the like Queen was the most powerful person, but the Parliament, like, Parliament still had a lot of influence. And this only increased throughout the reign. The opposition, however, argues that these weren't enough parliaments to make an impact. Um, there were only 13 parliaments in 45 years, so if there were, if there were more, um, if they had gained influence, there surely would have been more parliaments. She continued to ignore them, overrule them, and was willing to push, punish in the strongest terms if, if challenged. She ignored over 60 bills. So if they, if they had gained influence, why wouldn't they? She could do this, so she showed how they had not gained influence. She also kept on using charm to win over the members of parliament, so the whole golden speech thing. Um, if, even if they refused to request, she could dissolve it completely. So she had the power to call parliament and power to dissolve parliament. Well, it was a necessary inconvenience that gave English people the illusion they had an effect on decision making. It was a whole bureaucratic step and a whole amplification of the nobility's ideas. All laws passed by Parliament were a reflection of her own views. The religious settlement was moderate like her, and there was only like she only refused major legislation, I think, involving the religious settlement twice. There was take another 86 years for another dynastic challenge to arise and for a parliament, parliament to be seen with a new newer power and dimension. So that is government in the second half of the Tudor period. It's a very long video, so sorry about that, but I hope it helped. And yeah, thank you for watching. Bye.